Welcome to Present Poetry. I'm your host, Erin Crittenden, and all poems within this podcast are either public domain or are used with permission from the author or the author's estate. It's a fun time for poetry lovers of all ages, so sit back, relax, and get ready to hear some poems of the past and the present. This week's featured poet is Walter Pater. Walter Horatio Pater was born August 4, 1839, and was the second son of Dr. Richard Pater. After his father's untimely death, Walter's family moved to Enfield, where Walter attended the Enfield Grammar School until 1853, when he left to attend the King's School in Canterbury. While there, Walter read John Ruskin's Modern Painters, which inspired a love of art and prose. He eventually gained a school exhibition, which he took with him to the Queen's College in 1858. While in college, Walter was known as a reading man and consumed literature and philosophy at an astonishing rate. He originally had dreams of becoming an Anglican clergyman, but became disinterested in the Christian theology and remained at Oxford to teach philosophy instead. In 1866, he anonymously published his first critical essay on the metaphysics of Coleridge in the Westminster Review. He then published an essay on Winkleman in 1867, followed by the poems of William Morris' in 1868. In the following years, the Fortnightly Review printed Walter's essays on Leonardo da Vinci in 1869, Sandro Botticelli in 1870, and Michelangelo in 1871. These publications eventually turn into Walter's first collected works, known as The Renaissance, Studies in Art and Poetry, which he published in 1873. Now that Walter was the center of a small but literate circle at Oxford, he continued to publish essays and other critical thoughts about art, literature, poetry, philosophy, and life. Walter Pater unfortunately died of heart failure caused by rheumatic fever on July 30, 1894, at the age of 54. He is now buried at the Holywell Cemetery in Oxford, and his home at 12 Earls Terrace, Kensington, is now part of the English heritage. For this episode, instead of reading poetry written by Pater, we will be reading excerpts from his book, The Renaissance, Studies in Art and Poetry. This excerpt is from his section titled, Two Early French Stories. Theories which bring into connection with each other modes of thought and feeling, periods of taste, forms of art and poetry, which the narrowness of men's minds constantly tends to oppose to each other, have a great stimulus for the intellect and are almost always worth understanding. But it is not so much the ecclesiastical art of the Middle Age, its sculpture and painting, work certainly done in a great measure for pleasure's sake, in which even a secular, a rebellious spirit often betrays itself, but rather the profane poetry of the Middle Age, the poetry of Provence, and the magnificent aftergrowth of that poetry in Italy and France, which those French writers have in view when they speak of this renaissance within the Middle Age. In that poetry, earthly passion, with its intimacy, its freedom, its variety, the liberty of the heart, makes itself felt. This excerpt is from his section on Pico della Marandola. I said that the Renaissance of the 15th century was in many things great, rather by what it designed or aspired to do, than by what it actually achieved. It remained for a later age to conceive the true method of effecting a scientific reconciliation of Christian sentiment with the imagery, the legends, the theories about the world, of pagan poetry and philosophy. For that age, the only possible reconciliation was an imaginative one, and resulted from the efforts of artists trained in Christian schools to handle pagan subjects. Whatever philosophers had to say on one side or the other, 
whether they were successful or not in their attempts to reconcile the old to the new, and to justify the expenditure of so much care and thought on the dreams of a dead faith. The imagery of the Greek religion, the direct charm of its story, were by artists valued and cultivated for their own sake. Hence, a new sort of mythology with a tone and qualities of its own. This excerpt is from his section on Leonardo da Vinci. Poetry, again, works with words addressed in the first instance to the mere intelligence and it deals, most often, with a definite subject or situation. Sometimes it may find a noble and quite legitimate function in the expression of moral or political aspiration. In such instances, it is easy enough for the understanding to distinguish between the matter and the form, however much the matter, the subject, the element which is addressed to the mere intelligence, has been penetrated by the informing artistic spirit. But the ideal types of poetry are those in which the distinction is reduced to its minimum, so that lyrical poetry, precisely because in it we are least able to detach the matter from the form without a deduction of something from that matter itself, is, at least artistically, the highest and most complete form of poetry. And the very perfection of such poetry often seems to depend, in part, on a certain suppression or vagueness of mere subject, so that the meaning reaches us through ways not distinctly traceable by the understanding. And this principle holds good of all things that partake in any degree of artistic qualities, of the furniture of our houses, and of dress, for instance, of life itself, of gesture and speech, and the details of daily intercourse. These also, for the wise, being susceptible of a suavity and charm caught from the way in which they are done, which gives them a worth in themselves, wherein indeed lies what is valuable and justly attractive in what is called the fashion of a time, which elevates the trivialities of speech and manner and dress into ends in themselves and gives them a mysterious grace and attractiveness in doing of them. Art, then, is thus always striving to be independent of the mere intelligence, to become a matter of pure perception, to get rid of its responsibilities to its subject or material. The ideal examples of poetry and painting being these in which the constituent elements of the composition are so welded together that the material or subject no longer strikes the intellect only, nor the form, the eye or the ear only, but form and matter, in their union or identity, present one single effect to the imaginative reason, that complex faculty for which every thought and feeling is twin-born with its sensible analog or symbol. This excerpt is from his section on Johann Winkelmann. It followed that the Greek ideal expressed itself preeminently in sculpture. All art has a sensuous element, color, form, sound. In poetry, a dexterous recalling of these, together with the profound, joyful sensuousness of motion. Each of these may be a medium for the ideal. It is partly accident, which in any individual case makes the born artist, poet, or painter rather than sculptor. But as the mind itself has had a historical development, one form of art, by the very limitations of its material, may be more adequate than another for the expression of any one phase of its experience. Different attitudes of the imagination have a native affinity with different types of sensuous form, so that they combine with completeness and ease. The arts may thus be ranged in a series which corresponds to a series of developments in the human mind itself. Painting, music, and poetry, with their endless power of complexity, are the special arts of the Romantic and modern ages. Into these, with the utmost attenuation of detail, may be translated every delicacy of thought and feeling, 
incidental to a consciousness brooding with delight over itself. Through those gradations of shade, their exquisite intervals, they project an external form, that which is most inward in humor, passion, sentiment. Between architecture and the romantic arts of painting, music, and poetry comes sculpture, which, unlike architecture, deals immediately with man, while it contrasts with the romantic arts because it is not self-analytical. It has to do more exclusively than any other art with the human form, itself one entire medium of spiritual expression, trembling, blushing, melting into dew with inward excitement. That spirituality, which only lurks about architecture as a volatile effect, in sculpture takes up the whole given material and penetrates it with an imaginative motive, and, at first sight, sculpture, with its solidity of form, seems a thing more real and full than the faint, abstract world of poetry or painting. Still, the fact is the reverse. Discourse and action show man as he is, more directly than the springing of the muscles and the molding of the flesh, and over these poetry has command. Painting, by the flushing of color in the face and dilation of light in the eye, music, by its subtle range of tones, can refine most delicately upon a single moment of passion, unraveling its finest threads. Thank you for listening to this episode of Present Poetry. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review, share us on social media, or subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you would like to learn more about the featured poet, or you would like your work featured on the podcast, please check out the links in the show notes. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.